You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 182, Hebrews chapters 4, verses 1 through 13. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. It's been a busy week, you know, about that time of year when the normal chaos starts to veer into the vortex of why, why do I do all this stuff? <laughs> but October, November are always like that, so we kind of kind of expect it. Yeah. Did you do some recording for French pop as well? How'd that go? Yeah, we had a, a week or so ago. Um, we recorded 13 uh, episodes. So, you know, I think that's going to be starting probably late in the fall. Well, they'll, they'll start uh, putting up the channel and populating that. So we had a good week. We didn't have near the, uh, the glitches we had the first time. We ironed all those out. So it was pretty smooth. All right. Well, we'll be looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, we're in Hebrews chapter four. Now, uh, you know, we're only going to do the first 13 verses because whoever wrote the book of Hebrews has a, you know, I don't want to say an irritating habit of jumping between subjects and then returning to the same subject later on. But we're getting a lot of that uh, as we head into chapter four, all the way really through chapter 10. A lot of that stuff's going to be about the, the high priesthood of Jesus but there's going to be other things mixed in. So we're, we're going to try to uh, kind of tailor the episodes to sections that are coherent, that, that don't you know t- really take more than one subject at a time, try to work our way through Hebrews that way. So today it's Hebrews 4, 1 through 13. And I'm just going to start by reading um, chapter 4. We'll read through the, the whole thing, at least until the, the point where we're going to stop. And I well, maybe I'll just add on the other, the last few verses, because when we get to that point anyway, I'll be telegraphing what the next episode will be jumping into. But here in Hebrews 4, verse 1, let's start out. It says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, quote, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, unquote. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, verse 4. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, Again, quoting, they shall not enter my rest, unquote. Verse 6, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That's the end of verse 13. And chapter 4 closes with these three verses. And you can see right away how the subject matter changes, which is why we're going to be considering them in the next episode. Verse 14 says, Since then we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy 
and find grace to help in time of need. Now, for this episode, again, we're going to just do the first 13 verses and look at the way it starts. Again, if you're following the series up until this point, this, you know, the beginning of this should really sound familiar. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now that will stop there at, you know, toward the end of verse 3. That material sounds a lot like some of the things in chapter 3. I mean, it really takes us back to Hebrews 3, verses 6 through 8. And I'll just read those uh, real quickly here. Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the days of testing in the wilderness. So you get this theme of, you know, entering the promised land, you know, that we talked about the, you know, the rest of God, how, how that, this idea of refusing to let people, you know, enter into the rest you know, of God, enter into the, the the land and all that sort of thing, how that started back in the book of Numbers. You know, we talked about this in the last episode. And what kept them from going in was not a specific violation of the Torah, of the law. What kept them from going in was a lack of faith. In other words, unbelief. And here in, in Hebrews 4, 1 through 3, you know, we, we get the same thought. The promise of entering his rest still stands. Now think about that. One of the questions we, we raised in the last episode after we were talking about the relationship of, of belief you know, to all of this language, how, how disobedience in chapter 3 was defined as unbelief, again, not some specific violation of Torah. You know, we, we got into the whole subject of, quote unquote, losing your salvation. And I, and I, I made the statement, you know, a couple statements, you know, that which cannot be obtained by moral perfection cannot be lost by moral imperfection. And you are eternally secure if you believe. If you don't, you're not. And this is really what, what Hebrews is oriented around, this idea of maintaining your faith, holding fast to your confession, staying in belief. You have to believe. This is the, the, the lone requirement, the lone thing that God is, is interested in. And, and Again, the writer of Hebrews, you know, uses the analogy of this episode way back in Numbers, and it's not the only time we're going to see some. There, he's in chapter four; he's hearkening back to some other things as well. But this whole theme begins with this failure of faith, this this giving way to unbelief. Another way to say that is, they didn't believe in the promises; they just didn't believe them. And God punished them with forty years of wandering in the wilderness. Said, whoever does, didn't believe, they're just not going into the land. They're just not going to do this. And again, the, the land was where the temple was. And the temple was where God would rest. God would place his name. Uh, for those of you who have read, you know, like John Walton's book about Genesis 1, this is, this is the basis of the Sabbath. Genesis 1 is describing the creation of, of the heavens and earth in the same mode as the building and sanctifying of a temple, because, well, that's what, what God's temple is. It, it's on earth. It's in Eden. This is where, it, where the creation episode ends, because God has now taken up his residence on earth in his you know, temple, which is Eden. Again, the, the cosmic mountain, the dwelling place, the divine council, Yahweh's abode. These are familiar themes to anybody who listens to this podcast. And, and that became sort of the template you know, idea for rest, for temple, for God's dwelling, for the place where God runs his affairs. You know, it's tied into creation and it's tied into this, this establishment of the temple, the reestablishment of the place where God will come to earth and dwell with man. So th this, this ought to be familiar theology. And you need to, as, as the people of God, the ones that he wants in his family, that he has promised family membership to, he has promised eternal family membership to, what he wants from you is not moral perfection, because you, you're not going to give him that. You can't, by definition. You can't even, even do mostly perfect, as though mostly holy is good enough. No, you have to be made fit. 
for dwelling, you know, in the presence of God. And the way that you, that you do that in New Testament theology anyway, is you are united to Christ. Okay. You are made members of his body. He became incarnate, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 2, so that, again, he could effect redemption, not for angels, okay, not for anybody else, but the children of Abraham. Again, children of Abraham, you go back to Paul's language in Galatians 3, the children of Abraham are all who believe, whether they're Jew or Gentile. All of these themes in biblical theology are intertwined. They are not separate parts that don't operate or that, that do operate independently of, of, of the other ones. They are all intertwined. And so when we take all that, you know, to Hebrews 4, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 4, and we're going to hit it again later on, the, the issue is if you want to be in the family of God, if you want to have an eternal, you know, eternal life there, you want to enter into his rest, and his rest occurs where his house is, his temple is, his dwelling place, his abode, you must believe. That is the only requirement. You must believe. You can't forsake your belief. You can't turn your loyalty to another God or no God at all. And so this is why the people, the, the wilderness account, the people of Israel are used as a template to illustrate the idea. So here in Hebrews 4, I mean, look at, look at the language he uses. The good news came to us just as it, to, as it did to them. Again, the good news okay, the, you know, about what, what God's promises were, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Look at, the, look at the division. There are people who didn't listen and people who did. And listening isn't just, oh, well, that's interesting. No, listening I- implies they heard it and they embraced it. They believed it. Those are the ones who got to enter the rest. You go back to the wilderness wanderings, who gets to go into the land? Well, not a whole lot of people. I mean, from the first generation, nobody except Joshua and Caleb. Okay, Aaron has died. Moses is going to die, you know, before he gets into the land. So, first generation, you know, not not many, very very few. I mean, there are others besides you know Joshua and Caleb, and we we don't need to go back in the book of Joshua and read all that. But most of them are second generation. Those who did not commit the sin of unbelief. That is the, that is the issue unbelief, belief versus unbelief. And look at verse three here in chapter four, for we who have believed enter that rest. It doesn't say we who have been mostly morally perfect, we who have less sins accrued to our account than somebody else. It doesn't say that. This is not about behavioral perfection, even behavior at all. Your status as a member of the family of God is based upon your belief, your belief in the gospel. In the Old Testament, again, if you've read Unseen Realm, we talked about the relationship of of salvation that's consistent across the Testaments. How was an Israelite saved? He believed that God, Yahweh, was the God of gods, and that for some reason, this God of gods had entered into a covenant relationship with the children of Abraham. We have to believe that. And if we believe that, then what we do in life will reflect the fact that we we believe that, and it will show that we're grateful for God condescending when he had no reason in particular to do this. Deuteronomy 7, 7, and 8, the Lord loved you because he loved you. It doesn't say he loved you because of anything you did. Again, it's very consistent. Salvation in Israel was loyalty, believing loyalty to the God of Israel. And again, loyalty is not about performance. Believing loyalty is about you don't change teams. You don't shift your faith to another God or no God at all. It's very consistent in the New Testament. The object of our faith is Christ, who is the God of Israel incarnate and who died on the cross for our sins. Okay, Believing loyalty to him means this is the exclusive object of faith. This is the lone means of salvation. There is no other. We believe that, and we cling to that. We we keep believing in that, or we don't. So the theology of Hebrews is very consistent again with the need that the you know again this being the only litmus test, the need for belief. So you're eternally secure if you believe, and if you don't believe, you're not. And it's very consistent across the board. Now. You know, we get down into, again, these verses here. We've got, hearkening back to Hebrews 3, 6 and 8, 15 and 19, you know, which I read, 
again, I didn't, I didn't tack on verses 15 through 19. Let's just go back to, to chapter three real quickly. Again, the, the same themes. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In other words, don't fall into unbelief. You get down to, to verse 18. To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Well, what's disobedience? Is that a violation of the Torah? No. So we see that they were, verse 19, chapter 3. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And the disobedience here in Hebrews 3, Hebrews 4, is another way of referring to unbelief. It is not a specific you know, Torah violation. Now, we, if you remember the last episode, we, we got into all this. Again, I just repeated this little bit here from chapter 3. And we asked questions like, well, what about doubt? Well, again, questions are not unbelief. Wondering what God is doing isn't unbelief. Wondering why God did or didn't do something isn't unbelief. You know, unbelief is refusing to believe God's promise of eternal life. Okay, that, that's what unbelief is, rejecting the gospel in favor of some other God or nothing at all. Now, you'll notice, you know, I, I said last time that what if somebody does that? That's one of the questions. Well, what if somebody lapses into unbelief? You know, is it over for them? Can they come back? You know, are they just completely undone? And I said, no, because I use the analogy of Israel. Those who who had that happen to them, God still offered them through the prophets the chance to repent, the chance to believe again, the chance to come back. Look at how Hebrews 4 opens. First line, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, okay, it still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Again, we, we have an offer that, that's extended. It has not been withdrawn. And it raises the question of well, what, what, what does it mean by, you know, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. I'm going to read a little, a little section from Guthrie here to, to get us into this, this issue. Uh, Guthrie in his little Hebrews commentary writes, although the men of the wilderness, again, think back to the Old Testament context, failed to obtain the rest, the promise of it still remained for their children. Indeed, the assumption is made that the promise is timeless and is available still to the writer and his readers, hence the further exhortation. It is important to note that the first words according to the Greek text are, let us fear, therefore. The position of the verb gives it special emphasis. It would be salutary for Christians seriously co to consider the failure of the Israelites and their incurring the displeasure of God and to fear lest a similar calamity should befall members of the new community, the spiritual Israel, in other words, the church. The writer accepts without question that the promise of entering his rest remains, presumably because his doctrine of God is such that no word of his can be conceived to fail. Now, this whole idea of lest any of you should seem to have failed, you know, to, let me get their wording right, should seem to have failed to reach it. He, he, you know, the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, don't let this happen to you. Don't, don't let this, don't, don't slip off into unbelief. Don't let that happen to you. Now, the, the word translated seem in ESV is dokeo in Greek. It can mean to seem or like to appear, or it means to think. Now, ESV goes with seem, lest any of you are seemingly failing to reach the rest of God, lest any of you are seemingly failing you know, to, to, to be saved here. And if, if you translate it the way the ESV has it, it's sort of directed at those among his readership, the writer's readership, that his readers might presume to not be true believers. So again, let me, let me restate that in a, in a way that I think it might be better. If you go with the ESV translation, which is what I, I read Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. If you're someone listening to that or reading it in, in, this, in the original community, you might think, well, that comment's directed at maybe some of the, the, you know, the, the people that you know, we wonder if they're, if they're true believers. You know, there's uncertainty about whether this or that person that we know believes. Other translations, though, opt for think. And that the wording changes a little bit, and I think that the nuance changes as well. Lest any of you think you have failed to reach the rest of God or to, you know, to reach salvation. If you, if you look at it that way, then the focus here would be readers who are considering themselves. They're like sort of thinking about themselves when they hear this, you know, including themselves in the group. Perhaps they're wondering about some sin or some doubt. You know, they have some failure that has made them question their own salvation. Perhaps they've 
fallen into unbelief and are now wondering if they're cut off from salvation because their faith lapsed. Well, if that's the case, and that, that's just as good of an interpretation as you know the other, what the ESV has, then if you look at Hebrews 4.1, they can come back. The promise of entering his rest still stands. And I think that's really the way we, we, we need to look at this, because he's writing to an audience that's still living. He's not writing to an audience that's dead back in the days of Joshua. Okay, now he uses Joshua and the, the Israelites for you know, his, his point of analogy. But he's writing to people in, in, in a current time. And basically, when he writes to them, they might be thinking about somebody in their community that, that might seem to not really be a believer or they wonder about, or they might be wondering about themselves for, for whatever reason. And then the statement of verse 1 really becomes important. The promise of entering his rest still stands. You who, who are reading this letter, you who are hearing this read to you in the first century, who are under persecution, and you maybe you, you, you know somebody that lapsed in their faith, or maybe you lapsed in your faith. Well, I, I got news for you, okay? Don't, don't, you know, don't let that happen to you. Don't uh, you know, go off and then you know, not believe and then, and then suffer the consequences of it. We want you to know, the writer wants you to know, that the promise of entering his rest still stands. It's still there. It's still good. You can still partake of it. Don't be like the, the, that long ago generation where you had people that just, hey, let's go back to Egypt. This, this idiot Moses brought us out here to die. I mean, very, very clearly re rejecting the hand of God, the words of God, the promises of God through Moses. And they, if you remember in the last episode, part of that, uh, that episode in the book of Numbers, they, they picked up stones and they were, they were ready to stone Moses. I mean, they, their decision, they had cast their lot with unbelief. You know, they, they had made their decision, you know, and, and God punished them for it. Now, in this case, we don't have, the, you know, quite the same scenario. We have a warning that if you, you know, if, you know, if this happens to you, that there, there's going to be consequences. But even if you're wondering, even if you, you're thinking like, well, you know, am, am I there? You know, is, some, is my buddy over there? Is my sister, my wife, my husband out there? Look, he wants you to know in verse one, even if you think, you know, somebody might be here, even if, even if it seems like someone, you know, has, has sort of, you know, gone down this trail. Okay, the promise of entering his rest still stands. It's serious. You don't want this to, to be the case. You don't want yourself or, or anybody else to turn their backs on the gospel, to reject the gospel. Because as we'll see in, in chapter six, there is no other plan for salvation. There is no other means for salvation. There is nothing else God can do to save. This is the only way of salvation. So this needs to be something that's embraced and not surrendered. So he's warning them, don't, don't make that final, you know, don't, don't, don't reach that final point of rejection. But if, if it seems like this is the case, again, he wants you to know the promise of entering his rest still stands. So I, I think it's kind of important, you know, to, to note the wording there and again, the context if you go back to, to verse 3 in chapter 4, as we're working our way through the chapter, he has, For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. And this is a reference to the creation week, and the author is going to elaborate on the rest language in verse 4. For he has, you know, God has, or Moses has, you know, however we want to take that, has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, again, to take a look at, at Guthrie a little bit, Guthrie has, again, some comments here that I think are worth pointing out. He writes, what believers can now enter is none other than the same kind of rest which the creator enjoyed when he had completed his works. Again, there's this reference back to the creation week, back to Guthrie. He says, again, that we have the kind of rest which the Creator enjoyed when he had completed his works, which means that the rest, the, the rest idea is an idea of completion and not of inactivity. It's important to note that the rest is not something new which has not been known and experienced until Christ came. It has been available throughout the whole of man's history, 
This reference back to the creation places the idea on the broadest possible basis and would seem to suggest that it was part of God's intention for man. Rest is a quality which has eluded man's quest and in fact cannot be attained except through Christ. Jesus himself invited men to come to him to find rest. Okay, that's Matthew 28. Or Matthew eleven twenty eight to thirty. Come to me, all who are who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. And the idea of of rest there, in in both Jesus' term and here in Hebrews four, harkens back to this this notion of God resting from creation, his his work. Where does he rest? At home. He's in his house. Where's his house? It's well back then. It was in Eden. Okay, again we we come back to the Edenic theme. The home of God, the abode of God. Again, this is also you know, the cosmic bound. Where the divine council is. These these are our brothers. Okay, we're we're gonna be we're gonna be grafted in as family members with God's divine family. Hebrews chapter two. There will come a point when Jesus introduces us to God and God to us in the in the quote congregation in the council in Hebrews chapter two. So all of those ideas are connected to this idea, this idea of rest. Again, the point to retain is that this is about eternal life with God. Eden is the culmination of the creation week. Being, you know, God's done now. He's at home. He wants his family to be at home. He's there to enjoy his family. This is something prepared by God for humanity. It is not the result of our efforts. It's the result of his acts of power, his efforts, not ours. So again, we need to think about what we're looking at theologically. Again, it's very consistent. None of this is about us attaining a certain level of perfection through our own efforts or merit. It's just not in the picture at all. Back to Hebrews 4, 6, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and this 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 whole idea that this salvation, the promise of salvation is still open, it's still out there. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, this unbelief problem that we're drawing in from chapter three. Again, he appoints a certain day. So so even even though you, you you've had people lapse, verse seven, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Again, even even if there's been a lapse, do not stay in the status of unbelief. You can still believe. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Again, back to Hebrews chapter four, verse one. You might there might seem to be some among you, you know, that that are that are going down this path that the Israelites went, or or you might think. You know, it, 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 it's yourself. You know, you might, you, this might be an introspective. It doesn't matter, regardless if you're thinking about somebody else, if you're thinking about yourself. Today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Why? Because, verse 6, therefore it remains for some to enter it. Verse 1, the promise of entering his rest still stands. Again, take it seriously, because you can Go off into unbelief. And, and, and again, you, you can, if, if you do that, it's your choice to stay there. And some people do. But you should know that it's not a, you know, what's the French? Fait accompli. You know, it, it, it's not like a, a done deal. It's not the law of the Medes and the Persians. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest. Again, when you, hear, when, you, when you look at rest, think of, I'm coming home. I'm entering the home of God where there is eternal life with him and the rest of his family. It's where I belong if I'm united with Christ, because Christ is my brother, Hebrews chapter 2, okay? All of these thoughts are interconnected. So then, there, back to verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So the theme of not entering 
into my rest. This is Hagner now. Hagner has a nice thought here. The theme of not entering into my rest, quote unquote, is brought up again, Hagner points out here in the, this, these few verses here, 8, 9, and 10. This time the referent is one of the Psalms. As we saw in the last episode, again, this is me talking now, the first time this idea is introduced launching the wilderness wandering for 40 years, that was Numbers 14. The theme of not entering into the land, the place where the presence of God would abide and God's people would abide with that presence. Again, because of unbelief, a turning from God to one's own efforts or the aid of another God, this is a repeated theme. It's not just, you know, Numbers 14, we, we have it in other places. It's a repeated theme. The cycle and theme begins in Numbers 14, but occurs elsewhere. Now here in Hebrews 4, again, Hagner has alerted to us that, that we're dealing with a psalm here. The writer specifically jumps into Psalm 95, verses 7b, the second half of verse 7 and verse 8. Back to Hagner here, he writes, again, our author continues his midrash. Midrash is just a term for interpretation. His midrash on the psalm, applying the words, quote, entering his rest, unquote, to the reality offered to the church, again, to, to every, every believer. Following the pattern of Exodus typology, the promised rest in the land of Canaan becomes a figure or foreshadowing of the spiritual rest available to the Christian. The reason why the author speaks of this rest as continuing to be available is not given until verses 7 through 9. To interpret this rest in terms of a national political restoration, again, you know, think about some eschatological schemes that, that you know, you're familiar with. Again, this is me interjecting here. Hagner writes, to, to take these verses and think of a national political restoration is to miss the author's dramatic shift away from earlier limited perspectives toward an understanding of Christ as the fulfillment of the promises and the inauguration of eschatology. And basically, that's the end of the quote. Hagner's saying, look, it's just bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It's not, you know, about some eschatological focus. It's it's much wider. Now, what Hagner means by, again, eschatology here is the fact that Christ's ascension, which of course is the inauguration of the kingdom of God at his ascension and the coming of the Spirit, uh, in other words, the presence of God back to earth in a new temple, which new temple are believers in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 2 Corinthians 6. I mean, we back way back in our Ezekiel series in the second episode of uh, Ezekiel 40 through 48, I don't know what episode number it was, but we, we, we talked about the fact that believers are the new temple. This is what they're called. Jesus' body is the temple. We are the body of Christ. I mean, this is, this is familiar New Testament theology, or at least it ought to be. But, you know, all of that is, is, is legit in terms of you know, we can think of, of the rest of the people of God in some sense in terms of eschatology, because if we think of it in terms of the kingdom in a spiritual sense, the kingdom that was begun in the first century, again, because of the work of Christ and the coming of the Spirit and all that, well, that, that makes sense. But Hagner's point is that, look, if, if, you, if you're thinking of this as all in the future, it's only future, it's this millennium, it's this new temple, you know, kind of, if you're thinking of that of, of the rest of the people of God only that way, you're really kind of missing the impact. It's really referring to now, okay, that this whole rest idea, which is associated with where God lives, which is associated with the temple, and all these themes intertwined together, that's not just something out there in the remote future. It's something that's a present reality, is his point. You know, our, our frankly, our, our family communities, our faith communities, our churches are or should be kind of a foreshadowing of the rest, the family time we will have when the family of God is reunited in his presence in a global temple, a global abode of God. And notice, again, since I brought up the global Eden, the global abode of God, when that gets described at the end of Revelation, Revelation 21, 22, there is no temple. The earth is the temple. Again, all of these things, the, these themes are consistent. When you think of rest here in Hebrews 4, think of being at home with God, being, you know, think of salvation, think of the family of God, the, the, the church, the assembly of believers, whatever, whatever terminology helps you here, that, that, that's what the rest is about. It's not just like inactivity. It's not just, you know, had a rough day, I can, I can kind of sit here now. No, it, it, it's life 
with God and the family of God, again, the original Edenic plan, the original Edenic template. You're part of God's family, and there's stuff to do. Because, again, if you've read Unseen Realm, you're familiar with the content here, familiar with the Divine Council worldview. We are put over the nations. Okay, we, we, There's lots of things to do to you know, maintain the global lead and the creation you know, that, that, that God originally planned. The whole earth is now Eden. Again, we have relationships with each other. There's hierarchy. There's stuff to do. There, there's, there's the creation to enjoy. It is what should have been had the fall never happened. Again, it, it's not just sort of we're, we're kind of in a stupor. We don't have anything to do. We sit around the throne of God and just you know, sing just as I am for the 10 millionth time. Okay, that is not what the picture you know, is here. It's family life, it's community, it's relationships, it's it, it it's enjoying again the the, the fullness of, of of the earth made like Eden, you know it, it's it's carrying out the Edenic mandate again to maintain the creation to be steward kings of it and over it, you know we're not given details of what that means, you know honestly in. To an ancient culture, they would have conceived of those ideas in a particular way. We might conceive them differently. Again, we don't have specific ideas because, you know, the, the people who wrote this thing, you know, gave it a certain wording, had a certain perspective. Um, but no matter that, again, Revelation 2, Revelation 3, again, familiar unseen realm content. To him that overcomes, I will put him over the nations. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Jesus quoting a messianic psalm about you, about us. Revelation 3, I will let him that overcomes sit with me on my throne. You know, whatever the rulership entails, that's what we're going to be doing. But it's not going to be a passive, stupor-like existence. It's life in Eden, you know, with, with all that that entails, both in terms of its, its enjoyment and, again, any tasks that, you know, we would have to do to maintain that. Now, again, the implications here, just think about the wording. You know, we go back into into Hebrews four. This whole thing about how all of that, all of that that was described. You know, you go to verses seven through nine. All of that was. I'll, I'll just read verse ten. Whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Again, it's not the idea that that we have now a totally passive existence. Again, there will be plenty of things to do. But the, the notion that God worked and rested, and he extends the opportunity through belief, through faith, to be part of that rest, to be part of his family, that idea is linked here to the cessation from our own works, which I think is kind of interesting. You know, the implication is our rest that we have now, again, if we believe, we, we in some, some sense have it now because the kingdom, the rest of God has been inaugurated because the rest is the is connected to the kingdom. It is connected to the the family of God and the, and the home of God, the presence of God, all that. Our rest that we have now, if we believe, and that we will have eventually in its fullness, again, if we believe, if we continue in our faith, if we hold fast our confession, again, to use some of these phrases that the writer of Hebrews does, all of that is eternal life with God as a part of his family, and it's made possible by Christ, not our own efforts. Second implication, if Christ, the work of Christ is connected to us, in other words, this is how we get into the family of God. This is how we get into the kingdom. This is how we enter God's rest. That means that Christ is our Sabbath. Christ is our rest because we are joined to his body. His body is the temple. Okay, We are united to him through the incarnation and our belief in his work, Hebrews 2, we are members of his family. He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. That means that Jesus is our Sabbath, which by definition means other stuff. Even the Old Testament Sabbath is not our Sabbath. Jesus is our real Sabbath. Now this rest, third implication, is because of God's work and activity, not ours. Eden was God's answer to questions like, what is the destiny of humankind? Where should humankind live forever? It was a decision of finality. Okay, God rested in the temple house, earth, Eden, that he had built for himself and his family. 
there wouldn't be any additions to it. There's no revamping of it. It never gets modeled or remodeled. Okay. This is why the plan never changed after the fall. Our residence is going to be earth made like Eden. It's just taken a while after the fall. The destination doesn't change. God doesn't wipe out humanity. He made a way of redemption, started, you know, with that a long time ago, began the long effort to bring humanity back into his family and renew Eden. It takes a long time because he's committed to doing all that with the participation of fallible human beings who can act freely because God made them like himself. God didn't just hit the reset button and cancel human freedom or, you know, wipe humanity off the face, you know, face of the table, face of the earth. No, it takes a while to restore what was lost because God is committed to doing it with people as he made them. And that, that's just why. Fourth, if Christ and the salvation he brings is our Sabbath, again, back to that earlier point, then we don't need Sabbath observance as though that would contribute to God loving us as his children more, or to maintain God's loving disposition toward us. Sabbath keeping was not about merit in the Old Testament, and it certainly isn't about merit now. Sabbath observance contributes. Now I'm using my word, I'm, I'm picking the words here deliberately. Sabbath observance doesn't contribute anything to our standing before God. If you want to observe Sabbath, do so. If you want to remember the Edenic rest and the new Edenic rest brought about by Christ, do so. Saying that Sabbath observance or any, any act of Torah keeping at all, period, anything else, saying that Sabbath observance defines our relationship to God as his children fails to recognize that Christ is our Sabbath. And it was Jesus who said, take my yoke upon you and I will give you rest. There's no additional rest or a supplement to the rest. Okay, we don't add Torah stuff to enter into the rest. That is law keeping. That is works salvation. It is merit-based thinking. If you want to do some of those things, and I, I have many friends who do, you know, they, they do particular things or don't do particular things on the Sabbath. They observe like Jewish calendar. You know, wonderful. Do it. it I mean, it, it's, it's going to be fun. Enjoy it. It gets you back into your Old Testament a little bit. But if you think all of that contributes something to the way God looks at you, or the way God defines your salvation, your status, your membership in his family, you're wrong. This is why I said, you know, for, for the, the extreme, you know, Hebrew roots movers, I don't know what you do with the book of Hebrews other than just dislike it. Because this just steps on that thinking in, in very overt ways. Now, the writer's reference to Joshua, okay, here in, in Hebrews 4, I don't know if you caught that, in verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, this is kind of interesting. The, the writer of Hebrews re, makes reference to Joshua. And if we pay attention to that name, it sort of makes the whole point. You know, if Joshua had given them rest, of course, Old Testament Joshua couldn't and didn't give them all rest because he, he couldn't do that. Some of them rebelled. Some of them you know, didn't do what they were supposed to do. They, they went off and they worshiped other gods. Okay, you know, the, the, the earthly Joshua in the Old Testament couldn't do what the new Joshua did. Here's what Hagner notes. In the Septuagint, the Hebrew name Yehoshua, Joshua, was translated in Greek as Jesus, Jesus. While Joshua, the Jesus of the Old Testament, was unable to bring the Israelites fully into the realization of the promises made by God, the Jesus of the New Testament did accomplish this. The analogy must have occurred to the minds of the Hellenistic Jewish Christians as they read their Septuagint. Our author must consciously be thinking of this analogy when he goes out of his way to refer to Joshua, an otherwise unnecessary reference. Again, that's the end of the quote, but I think he makes a good point. Incidentally, this is yet another reason why saying Jesus, Jesus in Greek, why, why saying that that's a pagan name, like Zeus, it, it, it's really an, you know, another, another variant of the name Zeus, is total nonsense. Was the writer really trying to say that Old Testament Joshua was Zeus? I mean, the, the translator of the Septuagint, is that what they were saying? Old Testament Joshua, Old Testament Jesus was Zeus? It's utterly absurd. It's just, you know, this is, again, the kind of madness that needs to stop. There's no linguistic relationship between Jesus 
and Zeus. Might sound like it to our ear, but they're actually completely, the zeta of Zeus is not the sigma of Jesus, okay? They're actually completely different letters. So again, this is just nonsense. Let's go back to Hebrews uh, 4, let's finish the, the chapter here, or finish our section. In verse 11, the writer writes, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Again, the disobedience here, as we've said many times, the last episode, this episode, is about unbelief. That, that's what the disobedience is here, failure to believe. It's not work salvation. It's not doing good things or abstaining from what we shouldn't be doing. Okay, the, the striving to enter rest, back to Hebrews 3, 6, the holding fast of our confidence, means tenaciously believing in God's promises, believing in his promised rest, not our own merits to earn our rest. How do we know? Again, because he, he says here in verse 11, by the same sort of disobedience. Again, he's hearkening back you know, to this episode in the Old Testament, which we talked about last time, and of course some this time, that they didn't enter the land, they didn't enter the rest because of unbelief. Then you get to verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, Hagner again writes here, I, I like what he says here. These verses are closely related to the material immediately preceding. And that's clear from the, lo the strong logical connective for. So you get into verse 12, for the word of God. In other words, he's drawing a conclusion now. Based on what's preceded, he's, he's drawing a conclusion. Back to Hagner. These verses provide the reason or grounds for the exhortation in verse 11, thereby strengthen it. The word of God in the verse is the convicting word of God that God speaks to individuals. Our author has been calling the readers to heed the voice of God through his exposition of Scripture. It is that living and active voice that he has in mind rather than the written word as such. Although, of course, the voice is often heard through Scripture. The reference here to the, quote, division of soul and spirit, this is sort of a sidebar, back to Hagner here. The reference here to the division of soul and spirit should not be taken as teaching about separate components of the human being leading to, for example, a trichotomistic view of human beings. The author is not teaching about that subject, but is using analogies to point to the penetrating character of God's word. The word of God in this sense pierces through to the inner being of a person down to the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. It thereby calls for authentic response. Now, that's the end of the quote. I, if, if you want to get into that subject, I have a whole series on, on my website that I blogged about. Again, the, the biblical anthropology is sort of the, the label for it. Uh, you know, what's the nature of humanity? You can get into it there. I'm not going to spend any time on it here because... It's there on the website. So what, in terms of these two verses, you know, what does the living word help us discern? Whether we're good enough to have eternal life? Again, is that what Hebrews 4 is about? You know, Hebrews 4, all this stuff we've been talking about, entering into the rest, and the rest is still available, and don't, don't be like the Old Testament people who didn't enter the rest, and they, they failed because of disobedience, and, you know, they didn't believe, you know, all that, all that talk, everything we've been talking about, we get to verses 12 and 13, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, everybody, everybody knows this verse. What is, the, what is that verse in context supposed to teach us? Again, it's not teaching us that we need to look at the word of God or, or hear the voice of God in our minds to discern whether we're good enough to have eternal life. It's not about discerning whether we're keeping Torah enough. It's not about discerning whether we've sinned one too many times to have eternal life. It's not what it's about at all. It's about discerning whether we believe or not. It reminds us of what we need to believe and encourages us to believe. And it provokes us, the Word of God provokes us to trust the gospel. To really honestly to say anything else, any to say otherwise, is to divorce these verses from the context. And and that's just not what we do here. So, you know, the, the our section ends not with a prescription to, hey, go look in scripture and see if you're you're good enough to be saved. 
you know, go back and reverse, you know, or, or rehearse, you know, what the writer of Hebrews has said to this point. And, you know, and he says, now, you know, go, go look at the scriptures, go, you know, go test the scriptures, you know, go, go back there and look and see if you're good enough to enter the rest. Again, if, if you're thinking that you've missed not only the, the point of, of today's episode, but lots of points in other episodes here in the book of Hebrews, none of it, none of it, the failure to enter into the rest, none of it was about a precise, particular violation, moral violation of Torah. They didn't enter the rest because of their unbelief. And you, you got to keep this in mind consistently in, in Hebrews. And we're going to stop here with, with verse 13. Verses 14, 15, and 16 are going to start, they're going to shift into this whole subject of Christ's priesthood. And so we'll, we'll cover that in the next episode. And frankly, the, the priesthood of Christ is a theme from Hebrews 5 all the way into Hebrews 10. And it, it's going to look at it from different angles. It's going to go back and forth with other subjects. So we're going to try to navigate that in future episodes. But for here at this point, again, everything that has been leading up to this point is about, do you believe or not? And you say, well, what should we believe? Well, we believe in the incarnation, the salvation brute provided you know, through Christ, who is our great high priest. He is our representative. He is our mediator, all these things. Again, so you, it, 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 it's very understandable, again, since he's talking about belief, that he's going to lead to this, this notion that the one who not only provides this for us, but the one who sort of runs interference for us with God is the same person. It's Christ. So we have Christ incarnate, Savior, you know, the radiance of God, all this stuff we talked about in Hebrews 1 and 2. And then all of this extends from it. And now we're going to get to Christ as the great high priest. And so next time on the podcast, we'll jump into that material, get, get it started. But we're going to come back to this stuff. He's going to keep going back and forth between this, look at what Jesus has done, look at how much better this is than Torah, but you have to believe it. You just have to believe it. Okay, Mike, well, we'll be looking forward to next week where we wrap up chapter four and begin chapter five. And if you haven't done so, please go rate us, review us on iTunes, wherever uh, you can super podcast, let us know how we're doing. And with that, Mike, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.